The speaker is Justin Ko from Ecole Normale Lyon, and he's going to talk about matrix estimation problem. Justin, take it away. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, today, I'll be talking about matrix estimation problems, and this is joint work with um, recording in progress. This is joint work with um, Elise, with Elise um, Kione, Jonathan Hussan. Um, Soren Krasikala and Lenka Zaborotha. So I'm going to be presenting some of my um, current work related to matrix estimation problems. Um, aside from some polishing of the results, they, they should be posted quite soon. So the title is, is deliberately vague, matrix estimation problems, and it's sort of because I'm combining several results into one, into one talk. So I'll be first introducing what these matrix estimation problems are. I'll be going over what type of mathematical results we were able to, to, to get. And I'll also describe some of the um, general proof ideas behind it, if we have time. So let's begin with the description of our model. So we're going to be considering symmetric rank, rank of DN spike matrices with some inhomogeneous noise. So in particular, the matrices we're looking at are we're looking at matrices of the form Y, where there's a noise component, which is a standard um, Gaussian noise with a variance profile. And we're going to add to it a rank D of N spike. And my rank D of N spike will normally take the form X, X, X transpose X. And we're going to assume that the, that the variance profile will have some sort of block structure attached to it. And of course, we can take limits to, to, uh, to, to get more um, general block structures into the future. And this is the general type of matrix models we are, we are studying, and it has been studied by many people in this room, and hopefully my results today will, will, will sort of spread some more um, insight into the behaviors of these problems. So I've introduced quite a general spike matrix model, and these types of spike matrix models sort of contain a lot of models that have already been studied. For example, if I take my noise to be homogeneous, all the blocks to take the same value, and just by convention, I can define lambda be equal to one over the noise. Then I get the um, standard rank one matrix estimation problem, or rank D matrix estimation problem. And below, I have some data. There is a, there's some noise, and I want to see, can I see the signal within this noisy observation of the data? In the case when we add the variance profile to the um, noise matrix, different blocks might have different noise, so maybe that, that might make the estimation problem a bit harder or, or um, easier depending on which block we're in. So there's a bit more structure to our problems. And we're also going to consider the case when our rank goes to infinity, but at a sublinear rate. So if our rank is of little O of N, our signal is a lot more a lot more complicated. We want to say, can we re recover this as as um, n goes to infinity? So there are several statistical questions we can ask. One of the most natural questions is, well, how much information can we get from the signal? Can we recover from the noisy observation? Another question is, well how noisy or can we measure how noisy the signal can be until we can say something meaningful? Can we do better than a random guess? And the last question is, well, why should we even care about spec matrices? So the mathematical answers or the mathematical approaches to sort of answering these own questions is the first one is how can we measure the, how much information we can get? This is sort of computing something called the free energy. And we'll measure or we'll quantify precisely how much information we can get from the signal and the noisy observation. The question about re recovery is about some conditions on the size of the noise matrix. That is a question about phase transitions. When can we do better than a random guess? Well, that's sort of studying how much information we get as we vary the various parameters. The last question is probably the most interesting is, well, why should we care about these spec matrices? Is a question about universality. Is how many models fall under this framework or how general can our analysis be? So I will briefly go over some results related to all of them, and let's begin with the first question. So the first question is, well, how much information can be seen from the data? And there's a few ways to measure this. Um, one way is, well, we can compute what the minimum mean squared error is. That's sort of a measure of, of how much information we, we can get. And computing minimum mean squared error boils down to, can we compute the condition expectation of 
of our signal x given our observation y. And because of the nice or the simple model, we can actually write down explicitly what all the conditional laws are. And by Bayes theorem, we have an, ex an explicit form and it's, and it's just some quadratic function. And if you look at the normalization of this conditional probability and you take the one over a normalized log of it, then we get a quantity called the free energy. And the free energy in itself is an interesting object to study because it encodes the mutual information up to some constant that is quite easy to compute. But the hard part is, can we compute the limit of this free energy for these models? And there are lots of known results for limits of these free energies. They sort of have um, various different forms, so I'm just gonna present, to present the one that we managed to, uh, to um, derive. So let's consider the first case when we have a finite rank signal with some variance profile on the noise. For this model, we have an explicit form for the free energy, and the explicit form for the free energy will be given as a solution to some variational problem. So the limit of free energy is given by the supremum over some parameters over a functional. The exact form of functional isn't, isn't too important. What's, what's sort of in, important is, well, what parameters are optimizing over? And in, in, these, in these cases where there's a variance profile, the number of, of parameters depends on, I guess, how many blocks there are in my, in my, uh, in my, in my variance profile. And also it depends on the rank. So the rank depends on the dimension of objects. So um, we are optimizing over d by d matrices, and the number of matrices we're optimizing over is the number of blocks that, that appear in the variance profile. And there's an explicit formula to compute it. And of course, once you get the limited free energy, then if we can solve this optimization problem, then we have an explicit form of the minimal mean squared error written in terms of the optimizers of the functional I, I, I put before. And this is, this is almost exactly the same as the, as the homogeneous case, except we have some, um, some averages depending on, I guess, the size of the blocks of the, of, the, of the noise. On the other hand, let's suppose we have homogeneous noise, but we're considering a rank that sort of diverges to infinity, but not so fast, so the, so the rank diverges at a sublinear rate. And for these models, because I want to use some techniques from random matrix theory, we're gonna assume that my x is rotationally invariant, and to make sense of this problem in the limit, x has to behave nicely in the limit. So we're gonna assume that x, that the, um, that the empirical distribution of the eigenvalues converge to some, to some probability measure eta with some compact support, and it satisfies some large deviations principle with speed and dA. And again, for this model, we have a limit of the, of the free energy. There's an, there's an explicit formula for the function we're optimizing over. And the parameter in this case is, can be thought of as a probability measure which sort of encodes the distribution of the eigenvalues. There's a lot of terms in this, in this functional, but essentially what this object is, is it is the, if you consider what the, if you, can, if you compute the rank one problem and you take, a, take, take the limit, you'll get a sum of the rank one problems. And essentially what the problem is, is since we're taking the, the rank to infinity, instead of taking the sum, we're just sort of averaging, we're, we're sort of taking the integral in, instead. So this is the nice, the nice generalization of the rank one formulas to the case when the rank is of order n. And of course, these, these objects depend on the, um, the one-dimensional spherical integral and the BVP transition map, which encodes the behaviors of the outlying eigenvalues for these matrices. So, and again, once you have the limit of free energy, you can compute the minimal, minimal mean squared error for these problems. So I sort of quickly went through some formulas to compute the limit of the free energy. And the question is, well, using this, these formulas, can we answer the question about what conditions can we put on our noise so that can we say anything meaningful about our, our, our observation? So I have some results over here. Um, we can assume that our prior distribution, our way that we're generating the spike is, is centered. And, and our condition is, um, if we look at the operator norm 
of one over our noise matrix squared, sort of, sort of normalized or sort of averaged by the size of each of the blocks. If you look at the top eigenvalue, if the top eigenvalue is below some value, this corresponds to if our noise is, is um, big enough, then our minimal mean square error is, is basically just, that we can achieve is basically just a random guess. But after a certain point, then our minimal mean square error becomes better than a certain guess, which is, uh, which is um, given by the second result. And of course, right now, as it's written, this bound is clearly not sharp. And I guess the precise transition depends a lot on the underlying prior. But in the case when our prior is a standard normal, then we can prove that the transition is sharp in the fact that the first bound can be improved to, to match the second bound. And the way I've written this bound right now is maybe a, a, bit, a, bit, a, bit, a bit confusing, but I can normalize things. And what this is is basically a statement on this, of the signal-to-noise ratio for estimation problems where there's inhomogeneous noise. So the strength of the signal will be encoded by the top eigenvalue of the covariance matrix of our, of our data squared. That will encode the strength of the signal. And the strength of the noise will be encoded by the top eigenvalue of my normalized noise matrix, the variance of our, of our covariance matrix. So below us, if the signal-to-noise ratio is below a certain value, then we can get some, then we can say something meaningful about the recovery problem. And above a certain threshold, we, will, we can say, we will not be able to, to, to say something. So, so this result sort of encodes a way to, we have a high dimension noise, but the signal to noise ratio is a one dimension object that we can, that we can precisely check. And the question is, well, this bound is sharp for standard normals. Can we, can we say anything else for more um, general probability measures? And mathematically, this is a harder problem. Um, it's, it's a bit harder to, to, to solve the um, variation formulas, but we can compute it numerically. So if we consider Bernoulli data with, I guess, um, some probability of, of it being zero, so it's like sparse Bernoulli data, or sparse Rademacher data, then if the P is, if the, if the, if the signal is not as sparse, then it appears that the transition is sharp, that the free energy starts changing behavior precisely at the same point as the um, standard normal models. But when it comes sparse, then there is a, there is a, a gap, so the, so, the, so the free energy actually becomes non-zero at an earlier point. So um, it is still an, 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 an interesting question to sort of precisely compute it for all, for all prior probabilities. So these, those, those types of transitions were computed by um, studying the mutual information, free, mutual information formulas. Another few point is we can actually use random matrix theory directly to, to study these, these um, transitions. In the rank one, in the homogeneous models, what, what's a common approach is you can look at when does the top eigenvalue separate from the bulk. And to reduce it to this problem, well, we have a variance profile energy. Well, we can just we could just divide up by the variance profile, and in, and instead put all the put all the um, noise on the signal. So this reduces the problem to a problem with um, homogeneous noise. And one might ask, well, this is a very easy to model to 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 study. Can we consider? Can we study when does the top eigenvalue pop out for this transformed matrix? And what we can do is, well, we can compute this, this um, transition precisely. So the largest eigenvalue of the matrix after putting all the, uh, all the inhomogene, inhomogeneity on the noise to the signal happens at a certain value. Uh, this is a bit simplified. I'm, I'm, I'm considering the rank one case. So the covariance matrix just becomes the um, variance. And we get a condition that looks almost exactly the same. And the only difference is instead of one over the variance, we have one over the standard deviation in this model. So how does this compare with the transition that we found before? Well, in the case when our delta only takes one value, in the case when it's homogeneous, they're the same. So in the homogeneous model, both of these transitions happen at the same point. As soon as you have a, a a variance profile that is non-trivial, then it so happens that, it, that the region of um, deltas and rows where the, where the top eigenvalue separates 
is um, smaller. So the number of um, parameters such that the um, top ID by separates is sort of contained in the region that we found before. So there is a um, gap for these models, which maybe means that we're not looking at the right, at, at the, at the right matrix. So, so something about having the variance profile on the noise does, does um, change the behavior slightly. So what we've said so far was we have a way to compute how much information we can get from the signal and the noisy observation. We have some ways to look at these signals to see when does the phase transitions happen and what, how can we quantify the signal to noise ratio in these models. And my last point is, well, these spike matrices, they're, they're very simplified models, so why should we even care about them? And why should we even care about them? Well, let's consider a more, a more general inference problem. We're no longer looking at spike matrices, so let's generate data from some arbitrary probability measure. And we're going to, do to um, generate our observations condi conditionally on this, on this underlying signal from some known probability measure PIJ. And we're going to generate it independently, but for each index i and j, we can have a slightly different rule for um, generating these probabilities. And if we write the free energy associated to this um, general statics inference problem, we have e to the, to the, log, to the log likelihood of this, of this problem. And what we can show is that if the log likelihood um, obeys some regularity conditions, um, some conditions on the smoothness and, the, and some bounds on its first and second and second derivatives, and assuming that X has compact support, we can compute a matrix, one over delta ij, which is given ex explicitly as the expected value of the first derivative of the, log, of the log likelihood. What it says is that the limit of the free energy for these general statistical inference problems is exactly the same as a spike matrix model with a special choice of variance given by the noise um, computed on the, on the upper line. So this means that if we want to, this means that studying these spike matrix models will allow us to, to compute the mutual information for these more general statistical inference problems. And of, of course we can, we can also use the use the results for the spike matrix models to um, compute the limit of the, of the free energy for these general inference problems. And on the other hand, we can actually say a slightly stronger form of the inverse value. So what we said was that the free energies were the same. Well, we can say something more about the spectrums of these matrices. So of course, the, the matrix Y generated from the um, general inference problem will not be so nicely behaved, but if we do a particular transformation to the matrix, so if we compute the derivative of the log likelihood and evaluate our matrix entry-wise with this transformation, then we can show that after some normalization, that the spectrum of this normalized, um, of, this, of, this, of this transform matrix agrees with a normalized spike, spike matrix in the bulk eigenvalues, and that in the limit, that the transition, so the top eigenvalue jumps out at exactly the same time for both of these matrices. So some same about the universality of these spectrums for these matrices. And I have an explicit example of, I guess, a, of, I guess, a um, general inference problem that falls under this framework. So we're going to consider something called the degree corrected stochastic block model. It's the standard stochastic block models where you um, generate some graph and the chances of, 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 of um, edges being connected depends on which, on which, on which group each vertices belongs to. So the, these models have two parameters, lambda sort of um, encodes the uh, difference between the probability of, of um, generating an edge if you're in the same community and, and in terms of um, different communities. And in the um, degree corrected model, there's another parameter theta, which is attached to each vertex i, which sort of encodes the individual's vertex's um, likelihood of attaching a, 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 an edge. So what it is is that the location of the indices are now important as well as um, which, which, which group you belong to. 
and you can build an adjacency matrix for this problem. It's, it's a matrix of plus or minus ones, and you'll be sort of um, generated conditionally if, if, if the groups are, if the people are in the same group or not. So if we look at the spectrums of these two matrices, the adjacency matrix and the spiked matrix with the, with the right variance profile, then the spectrums are, are very, very different. But if I apply the transformation I had before, then these bulk of the spectrums sort of look the same and the top eigenvalues separate at, these, at the same point. So we have some sort of universality in that. We have some really complicated data, but if we apply some nice transformation to it and look at the corresponding normalized spike matrix, then the spectrums behave the same. So I guess understanding the spectrum of these spike matrices can sort of understand at least some more um, general inference problems. And I have a few minutes left, so I have just quickly some, some proof ideas or, or, how, or how we approach these problems. And um, in the case when we study spec matrices with, um, with um, variance profiles, it sort, of, it sort of boils down to can we compute these integrals? And if we look at the Hamiltonian for this model, then there's a lot of terms, but if I ignore the last two objects, then the Hamiltonian is basically a multi-species um, Sherrington Kirkpatrick Hamiltonian with vector spins. And mathematically, these objects are very, very well studied. So we can use tools from spin glasses to compute the limit of the free energy. And from there, we can compute, compute the, um, the, um, the um, thresholds. And the universality sort of follows from the universality of, of disorder for these spin glass models. And on the other hand, in the case when we have a, a um, grown rank problem, then the free energy sort of boil down to can we compute objects called the spherical integrals? And the main result that will allow us to compute it in the, uh, in the um, grown rank case is that for spherical integrals, when the rank of, of one of the matrices is of sub if it's of sublinear order, then we have an explicit formula, and this explicit formula will be given as the sum of the one-dimensional um, spherical integrals, where the top eigenvalue of the temperature matrix is matched with the corresponding ordered eigenvalues of the matrix AN. So we have an explicit formula, and this, this behavior is very, very different than the extensive rank case, but up to little or than the, the formula for these spherical integrals are, ex are, are explicit. And um, that's it, so thank you for your attention. Questions for Justin. Hi, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, you showed at some point something on the, on the BBP transitions for this uh, homogeneous models? Yes. And okay, I'm not sure I completely understood the message. So you're saying that basically there is a gap between when an eigenvalue pops out and when the MMSC in the free energy becomes uh, non-trivial? That, that's right, that's right. So for, in the homogeneous case, there is there's no gap, but I guess um, this, is, this is for a very, a very specific matrix. I was, I was only computing the, the BBP transition when I Put all the when I remove the in, the in, the in, the in, the in, in homogeneity. I think that in the in the Gaussian prior case, That's the right. free energy transition is sharp, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So in the in the Gaussian prior case, you really can say that you have an eigenvalue that pops out before um, you recover anything about the signal. That's right. The, but it, it, there's a caveat in that I'm looking at the BV transition of a of a. Of a, of a very specific matrix. So maybe I'm not looking at the, at the, at the right matrix. So, so the, na the naive choice of removing the, the, uh, the uh, variance profile by putting it all in signal may not, may not be the right choice in the matrix, so. Okay, but, sorry, just to clarify. So the BBP transitions happens before or after the you can recover? Like, you oh. can, sorry. Yes, so the number of. Ah, okay. Okay, so you, sorry, so you can, you can recover before the eigenvalue pops out. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, sorry. So it is... Uh... If, yeah, it, it goes in the right way so that there's no contradiction. Yeah, okay. That's, that's fine. More questions. And is that true at all levels? Like, do you recover, uh, do you fully recover the signal before 
all the relevant eigenvalues pop out of the book? Oh, um, I'm not sure. So this is just a weaker statement in that the minimal means means mean squared error for the for the problem becomes non-zero, and in that in in that in that region, then the then the top eigenvalue in that top eigenvalue pops out. Whether we're looking at the right matrix or whether um, whether it's the yeah, whether it's the right matrix to to look at, I don't I don't know if, if it if it is. So so maybe if we look at a at a um, at a um, at a um, different matrix, then maybe the um, transition happens where precisely. So so what this is is that if I look at this at this at this matrix, the top eigenvalue pops out um, in a region of of um, of one parameters where the MMSE becomes non-trivial, and there is a gap if we look at this at this normalized matrix. Um, how important is it to assume that you have this block structure for the variance matrix? Could you do this? Is it just for this optimization problem that it becomes oh, feasible, or is it yeah. also critical in other parts? Um, we can, I guess, um, if the deltas were generated from a positive semi semi definite kernel, then we can do approximations. So with these with these with these block models, so um, the formula becomes a lot more complicated. But as long as we can do a uh, Discrete approximation, then then these then these results results hold, but the formulas become more complicated in, in that case. Okay, a lot to ask one. What breaks in the linear rank regime? Oh, sorry. Uh, what breaks if you want to try to analyze the case in which the rank is linear? Oh, I see. Yeah, then the. Um, in the ex. In the sub in the sublinear rank case, then we have that we have a sum of um, uh, then the limit of the um, speaker interiors can be written as the sum of the one dimensional problems. In the extensor rank case, there's there's um, there's um, different formulas, I guess, proven by at least at least Gernay and um, and um, Zhao Yang that sort of ex expresses the limit of the sphere integrals as a um, different object. So I guess the asymptotics just just um, just um, do not match. Okay. Thank you very much, Justin.